Jay Colette Yunkela, thank you so much for coming to join us on AYB on Sunday to speak to the nation. Uh, we truly appreciate the time. Thank you for inviting me. So we just want to start with a little bit of background. Um, everybody knows you as the former head of UNIDO, but most may actually not be aware of what you were doing before. So tell us a little bit about what you were doing before. Before UNIDO, I served also as Minister for State, Industry and State Enterprises. 94-95. Uh, Before that, I was teaching and doing research at Michigan State University in the U.S. Before that, I was doing my Ph.D. and also served in the administration at the University of Illinois College of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've clearly held a lot of positions of power, positions of influence, positions of responsibility. So how or what have you done to benefit Sierra Leone with these particular positions? Oh, I've done quite a bit. I mean, first of all, when I was teaching at Michigan State, I used to organize the Sierra Leonean community there to send books back to schools here through the Catholic Church, Caritas, uh, Bishop Ganda. We also hosted him there on the campus uh, for about a week to promote Sierra Leonean educational institutions. Um, I remember that I took a leave from that job as well to come here home and serve as minister when things were very tough during the war years. In addition, um, you've heard of the many, many UNIDO projects here uh, that ran over almost uh, 15 years in this country. In addition to that, uh, when Ebola struck, I came here four times. I went on glo the glo global scene, Al Jazeera, CNN, BBC, you name it, they're top shows, just advocating for more resources for our countries that were suffering. At that time, the resource flow was very slow. Um, at that time also, it's on record, I linked President Koroma to the WHO Director General. I, I, I facilitated that first discussion between them. In addition, um, apart from the projects I mentioned, um, I helped to support investment promotion initiatives, especially by President Anes by Koroma. His first Sierra Leone is open for business conference in London. I facilitated for him. I was the moderator and facilitator of that initiative. But there are the many projects in this country. Um, the, the most uh, one that is debated today is uh, Bank Asoka, the Fisheries Training School, the Standards Bureau. Um, we supported a lot the, um, the investment promotion agency here. So there are many things one tried to do for the country to benefit from the role we had. The last thing I did before leaving, I actually flew in here to persuade uh, President Koroma to send his Minister of Energy to my last major event at the UN in 2015 to sign an MOU with the EU for uh, energy sector support. And before then I had supported other countries to get that, but we were left behind and the videos are there when I facilitated and they actually fast-tracked it, again because of goodwill. So there's a lot we've done over time, oh, privately but also public. Now those who would argue that as of course, uh, being part of former head of the UNIDO, that Sierra Leone is already a part of the UN, and mm. it's according to the UN's agency mandate that mm. Sierra Leone would benefit from these programs, mm. whether or not you were heading it as a Sierra Leonean. So, uh, you, you can you say you're mm. laying claim on something mm. that would have happened anyway. No, it would not have happened that. anyway. You can see the difference. I stepped down four years ago. Go check the portfolio. The portfolio here is less than three hundred thousand dollars. You go back and check the eight years of Yum Keller. You see, it's millions of dollars. The fisheries training school alone is about 1.6 million. By the time you think of Bank Asoka and the many projects, the project portfolio volume here was much larger. Why? Because I helped personally to talk about my country. You can see the videos. I was marketing my country. President Kuruma himself has said it over and over, that this guy was raising our flag everywhere. Whether I'm on CNN or somewhere else, giving lectures around the world, I took my country as a microcosm. Because at that time, you have to understand the context it was always ranked at the bottom of the hip, 2008. You know, lowest human development index. So I always said to colleagues, if all the theories of development and paradigms we propose are true, let's start from a small country like Sierra Leone. So sometimes they will call my bluff. Okay, we'll do something in your country. So yeah, there are a lot of those, and as I said, you can check the portfolio yourself as a media people, go do your research. Look at the portfolio of programs in this country from 2005, to 2013 when I stepped down. Then you look at the last four years, you'll see it's a minuscule today. Because yes, and people just assume that things will just happen. They don't just happen. 
sometimes you need champions to promote your cause. And, like and it takes a lot of time. I like that you mentioned that because you've, you've had the platforms to speak to various global leaders, yeah. various presidents across the world, being, as I said before, powerful positions. But as a, as a doctor, a doctor, of course, you've, you've studied quite far and wide. But it seems the theory is there. How are you going to be able to translate that theory into reality for Sierra Leoneans? Or is it just talk? People assume that when you have a PhD, you are an academic. I spent some time in academia, but I spent more time in development. So I've been in institutions where, yes, we go from analysis to concepts, and then we develop projects and programs to implement. So there's always some link between analysis, theory, and practice, and then the feedback to improve the knowledge, so you improve the impacts you have. So I have done that in my career in development. I have always been at the forefront of creating uh, uh, new initiatives and programs uh, based on theory. For example, I was director of Africa programs for some time, actually helping to formulate industrial development programs in countries and supervising those who do it. I did not stop there. I also served three years in Nigeria doing actual projects. So there are some ministries in Nigeria, when you say Dr. Yumkela, they say yes, he helped us. If you go take Nigeria, for example, I used to leave Lagos to go all the way east to Anambra State, Enugu. There is a place they call Aba, helping the leather producers, the garment producers, going to the design center in Newe. You can research these things. What am I saying? My work involved helping p countries to formulate their needs, getting experts together to look at those needs and formulate programs to bring solutions to them, helping them get funding for those programs, then sending in evaluation teams. So having a PhD is, in, is, is good, but it is not a necessary condition. But I have used my knowledge, and I tell you, if there is anything I believe Sierra Leoneans should appreciate today, given our recent experiences, is that professionalism matters. It matters for people to have the right skills to understand the complexity of development. People think sometimes in this country, and a common sense, anything can happen. No. Gone are those days. Economics is complicated. Macroeconomics is ex complicated. People need to understand the ramifications of policies, short term, medium term, and long term. And of course now, when you add the dimension of sustainability, you begin to see that you have to think sometimes in the nth dimension. But here sometimes policy is focused on one solution, one idea, forgetting the, the bigger implications for other sectors or for the environment in particular. So yes, I'm a, I'm a practical person, but I tell you, my work, even my advocacy, is based on analysis. I read like, like hell. I read, I look at other sources, first to gain knowledge, but to make sure that my advocacy is evidence-based. It has to be evidence-based. You know, I mean, I, I would like to challenge you here, uh, Dr. Kande. Uh, it seems your ideas sound great, but how do you then translate that to the regular Sierra Leonean to understand? So that, I mean, if you look at the majority of the Sierra Leoneans who are here, the literacy le levels are not quite high. Well, you see how the... You translate it so that it's effectively it, understood by... For a man like me who has been in development, I'm used to doing that. Whether in Sierra Leone or in India or another country, that's what I'm telling you. That's what I have done for two decades. I have been able to go to countries, very poor, illiterate people, listen to their needs, come back, formulate programs to respond to their needs, and then go back and help to do implementation. So here, the evidence is there. Do you see the kids who rally, go to my rallies? Do you see the lectures I do around this country? These kids are hungry for that knowledge, and I break it down. Recently, in Kenema, one of my best examples I tell friends around the world, I say, imagine rem arriving in this location, they had told me it's a student forum. I said, you have 2,000 people packed in the hall, and I was trying to gauge my audience, because I was going to talk about sustainable development goals and sustainability. So I asked the audience, how many of you are students? They raised their hands, one third. How many of you are traders? Oops, another 25%. So I said to myself, now how the heck am I going to explain sustainability and intergenerational equity in Creole? But I've been able to do it here. I've been able to convince kids about how we, we, we came up with the goal number seven in the sustainable development goals. What does energy access mean? 
What does it mean when you have a, a energy as it relates to the health sector? And I've seen the feedback from them based on their questions, that they, they get it, they get it. And the ordinary people, I've been around this country, I've been to the swamps of, uh, uh, slums of Moab, Kanike. I've been to slums in other uh, to uh, towns in this country. Yes, I connect, I advocate, I connect, I listen to them. And by the way, I learn their languages too, meaning that I learn to understand them. Because some of my interaction with them is in fact to teach myself. I came back to this country deliberately, two and a half years before elections. I realized that I needed to learn more, to understand more by going through the process, to understand how I can adjust what I have learned, what I know, to the realities of this country. So I am not just somebody who flew in last minute to try to run. No, I have spent over two years here to understand even better my people and to begin to analyze, again, based on my professional training, the problems they have okay. and the solutions they think they need. Let's talk about one of the contributions you mentioned in the energy sector, the Banker Soka Dam. Um, the government is refuting that you contributed, or this was one of your contributions to the energy sector. What is the true story? The true story, the story is that, yes, 2012, um, we brought that project here, but it had a history, almost six years. Remember, for an energy project of that size, you have to do pre-feasibility study, feasibility study, design of the technology, secure investment to come in and get an implementing agency. In this case, a Chinese company implementing. So when people think Bank Asoka just suddenly came when the APC government came into power, hell no. But you know your best evidence, that's why I was trying to, I have the video here of Mr. President, 2012, April. Play it for your audience, in the, in the public. So let them judge for themselves. How can people have amnesia after five years? That, that project, to just state on yeah. on Sunday, we will be willing to play this clip. We'll give you, we'll give you the clip of Mr. President. You hear his voice, let the people hear his voice. You hear my voice giving the history of the project in front of the Chinese ambassador and the company that came. You hear the voice of Alpha Khan recognizing all the chiefs who were there and the people. And the president starts his statement by thanking the people of Putloko for being there. So tell me, somehow I even think they're insulting the people of Putloko. You cannot five years later tell the Putloko people that it never happened unless you want to abuse their intelligence. They were there. In fact, they were there when we were visiting the bush, looking for the site. If that is not enough, I give you another reference. The Chinese government, CCTV, did a documentary called Yum Keller Man of Energy in 2013, a year after we had uh, inaugurated this project, which they aired for months globally. A, a good part of the segment is on Banka Soka. So if our own videos that are in YouTube are not enough, of what happened in April 2012, then watch the Chinese CCTV. So when I hear people now saying, oh, it's a Chinese company, of course it's a Chinese company, because you design the project, but when it's Chinese aid, a Chinese company implements it. So when I hear people now doing revisionist history, but let me tell you what is sad about this. This is the typical way governance has been done. People go hungry in this country, they lie to them that they're not hungry. People don't get salaries on time, they say, oh, everybody gets their salary on time. The WHO tells you four weeks ago, this is the worst place to be a youth. You say, no, the youth are happy. Propaganda has a limit. And as they say, you can't fool all of the people all of the time. When people don't get their uh, salaries on time, they know it. When youth have high unemployment, the people graduate three years. They don't have a job. I don't care how much propaganda you make. And that's why we're in governance. We are stepping forward to say the lies are enough now. We want facts. We want data. You cannot tell us that they didn't steal Ebola money. Even when the British papers, unfortunately, last month, the, the uh, ICRC also says, oh, Sierra Leonean entities stole over two million. So the propaganda is enough now. They have to know that with the youth bulge we have and the potential that our population could double in a few decades, that we have a crisis looming here. If we don't grow this economy, if we don't improve education, we'll be shortchanging these kids their future. So all this propaganda, when I saw what happened with Bank Asoka, let me tell you, I knew it was gonna happen. I said, I welcome, I welcome it, bring it on. Because okay. then we go to the Potloko people, and I really tell them, 
that they're trying to abuse your intelligence. It's the same way they lie about everything else, even the corruption in the country. Dr. But Fred, we'll expose it. Let's talk about uh, the political uh, situation. The political reality in Sierra Leone is that most people are ingrained or actually born into the two political parties, the two major ones, the APC and the SLPP. Now, you just started your campaign barely six months before the election. How do you think you are going to be able to change the mindsets of Sierra Leoneans? The premise, first of all, is wrong. I, I had a movement in this country since 2013. Kande Yumkela movement, KKY movement global in this country. It had structures across the country. I have been back in this country over two years. So I'm not starting my presidential bid now, remember. So I like it when people underestimate. Just declared the other day. Uh, no, what I'm saying to you is people knew I didn't hide it. Before coming here, I already did a town hall in London in July 2015, saying I'm stepping down from the United Nations and I'm going back to my country to see how I help bring development there. So everybody knew, and I've been interviewed at infinitum, but I've taken my message around the country. But let me address your central thesis that people are stuck to their parties. Well, I've already demonstrated to the nation that you don't have to stick to tradition if it keeps you in the bondage of poverty and ignorance for too long. So I know it's resonating with the kids and you hear them around the country, change must come. People should not underestimate that. We still have 650,000 new voters in this country. We have 1.8 million young voters between 18 and 35. We'll test that hypothesis of yours, that people are stuck. These young kids are not stuck. They want to be more educated. They want to have jobs when they leave school. They don't want to rely on party cards to get jobs. They want professionalism. They look at people like me and others. They say, whoa, these are role models. We want to be like them, even better than them. That's the alternative we offer for them not to accept the status quo, whether it's tradition in a party or accepting corruption and poverty as their destiny. Nobody is born to be poor. It has been said time and time again by various political analysts that when it does come to the voting time, it's one thing to get a crowd out to a stadium. It's another thing to get them to vote for you. And it is predominantly vote red or green. Do you honestly think you stand a chance? More than on honest, honestly think, I am convinced and I'm passionate and will get the votes. We are not relying on rallies. They will see a campaigning style. I can't reveal my tactics here. And that's the beauty of what I'm doing. And that's what I'm used to doing. When I took up the energy agenda of the world, it's one of the most politically sensitive topics in global negotiations. But I tackled it 10 years, dedicated time, good narrative, good analysis, and I pulled it off. It's the same here. Those who think this, the voters are stuck, let them go home and rest, then they leave the platform to us. All I ask, give us freedom. No intimidation. Let us take our message village by village, street by street. Let's see. So for me, that's the beauty. I am ready to challenge the orthodoxy. I am ready to show the kids of this country, the young men and women who need a better future, that yes, you can be part of that change. Let us not accept poverty and the bondage of corruption as our destiny. You can change it, join me. So we will see. Okay, I, I'll, I'll be happy to sit with you in March and say, whoa, I'll be happy to I, I am the new president of the republic. You seem quite confident. Very much so. About this race that you're getting yourself into. Presidential campaigns are the most expensive. Anywhere you go in the world, it, it requires a lot of money. It seems that you put your monies together. Uh, Sierra Leoneans would like to know how. You got your finances together. Well, we're, to enable you to run for this we're asking people to help. I'm using personal resources as well. Some friends are helping, you know, to support. People are contributing T-shirts. Uh, some would give us airtime as well. So it's a people revolution. Obama did not have money. He relied on movements. That's why we were smart enough. We created a movement five years ago. So yes, every now and again, I call up diaspora folks. And suddenly they put together, they send $10,000 or they send materials, they send printers, computers. So we rely, that's why it's a people's movement. That's what is new here. And is I'm happy. The secret to your success? Eh? The fact that you're pulling in various people to be a part it's of the Yes, that's why we're a coalition of progressives. You know, people think the coalition only has to be a coalition of parties. If you check again, I'm a very consistent person. I did a speech at Howard University almost six years ago. And I started talking that Sierra Leone needs a coalition of progressives. 
Progressives are in APC, they're in SLPP. Progressives are young men and women who are just ambitious for a better nation. They're dreaming of being like Ghana or Kenya. You understand what I'm saying? So we're trying to rally those, and I tell you they're coming from every nook and cranny. And I have said to people, they say, well, why APC? I said, there are people in APC that I know who had ambitions for the nation, but they feel they've not been able to fulfill it. Their enabling conditions were not there. The governance style was not what they expected. There are people in SLPP similarly, and other parties. Eventually, we'll have strategic alliances with other parties, you know, based on a value addition principle. But I'm telling you here that, yes, um, part of our success is that we have an open platform. All, it's the rainbow party. Everybody comes in. Are you yeah? shopping around for other political parties? Which political parties are these that you're going Several to of them are approaching me. Several of them are approaching me. And we're in good conversations. Some of them, the conversation has been on for some time. But I've seen, yes, an increase in interest. But again, as I say, a, a, a discussion on based on value addition. Remember, I was in industrialization. I'm used to value addition along a value chain. So yes, we want to collaborate with you, but what do you bring to the table? What's your support base? Yeah? Uh, what's your message? What's your philosophy? It's not just for the sake of lumping together parties, no. But we know we have a robust engine. If we have to go alone, we're ready. We're ready. All right. The Citizens Manifesto is demanding that all presidential aspirants declare their assets publicly. Are you going to do it? I believe it's a good proposition. I'll do it if everybody signs off that we all do it together. When are you going to do it? Does well, it depend on other signs? It off? depends because uh, those who have ruled this country for a while, I believe they should also be asked to do it. So we all sit on a table, we sign a memo. We're not going to do it piecemeal. We've seen Kevin yeah? Remember, who's also a flag bearer, declaring his assets publicly. Why can't you stand out? amongst the crowd, be part of the change, and declare your I, I'm not a show off. I, all I want to do is, I need the principles as well to play ball. So what I say to the NGOs, 700 NGOs put that manifesto together. Invite all of us. That's what I'm used to doing. I'm used to having mem MOUs and communiques signed by nations and entities of interest groups. I want all of us to sub submit ourselves to that. Samura, Kamara, Mada, Bio, myself, and others, everybody. And I'm ready. So one of your clarion calls is that change is coming to Sierra Leone. Break it down for the ordinary Sierra Leonean. What does this change? The ordinary Sierra Leonean, it means that we manage the economy well enough, so we put inflation under control. It's at 18% now. Yeah? What does inflation mean? It means a rest there. It don't come off from 150, so until 250. You bring it down, and that change means. More yeah? money in their pocket? It means more money in their pocket, my sister, yes. They can now pay school fees for their kids. Yeah, they can pay for their family in hospitals. Change means jobs for the, for the youth. They don't have to be hanging around, no jobs. Such high youth unemployment. Change means you stop those who just literally steal money from the ministries and government agencies. My estimate is between 60 to 100 million dollars that just disappears in this country. And you also control your expenditure. We were told last year that there will be austerity measures. Go read the IMF and World Bank report. There was no control over expenditures, but we'll debate that when we start debating and look at economies, I mean, the, the economic issues. So change means we, man, we reduce that corruption. So we have money in our hands to put toilets in the schools, to give clean water in the schools, to pay the ex-servicemen good benefits and bring them back into productive life. To make sure we don't have teachers here who are not on the payroll identification system. So that's what change means in, in simple terms. But it also means the market woman sells at the end of the day because inflation is under control. They have enough returns to go home and feed their family. Today they tell you, I go to the markets. I campaign like hard eh, in this country. You go to the market, say, pa, after I don't sell, better not day. So then they are for sell the oil in container for life, even get a small thing for go back in the house. We have to change that dynamics. The other thing change means lower that interest rate. Private sector here have to borrow 23, 25%. They literally just work for the bank. Why? Because the government is bankrupt. They're raiding the banks. I have the data. Yeah, around 2011, 722 million dollars in external, external debt, yeah? By 2016, June, July, it was 1.2 billion. Domestic debt was 3.3 trillion last year. It's about 4 trillion now. So what do you do when you don't have money? You raid the banks, you put more treasury bills and bearer bonds, interest rate goes up. 
businesses cannot borrow, they can't employ. So you see I broke change down for you. It means more hospitals. Yeah? It means when you're doing a road that is $1 million per kilometer, you don't make it $4 million because the $3 million was supposed to go to the education of our kids. It was supposed to go to the hospitals. But yeah, somebody has become rich. And because he's rich, he says he should be president because he was smart enough to be a kleptocrat. That's what change means. And you don't rob the kids of their future. And you come out, give them cash, they dance behind you. realistic with um, your ambitions, given the fact that the minute you do get into office, and I will ask you about the first 100 days you get into office, mm -hmm. what you plan to achieve. But the minute you get into office, there's a previous government you have to deal with and what it is that yeah. uh, may have happened in the previous government. And then there are your plans. Yeah. Uh, Promising the youth employment, yeah. promising hospitals yeah. to be built, promising an economy yeah. that's going to flourish. Yeah. Isn't that a bit too much to be promising the people of Syria? You, is the reality in this? You wait, you wait to see my manifesto. We're going to have it first 100 days, first two years, three years. Yeah? There are some targets, building such facilities that would be medium long term, medium term like two years to the five years. There are other things we can do quickly. So I'm very much aware of that. I'm a development expert. So I know what you can do, low-hanging fruits in the short run, what you can do in the medium term. And that's what makes me distinct from some others. So I'm a first development hundred person. Days. First, hundred first days, hundred days, there are some, yeah. First of all, you have to set the tone of government. I have to choose a cabinet that people will be proud of. Square pegs in square holes. Not to everything, not common sense, yeah? So I put the right people in the right place. Are you willing to the, choose from the, across the divide? It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Obama had to do it. Others have done it. It's about professionalism. If somebody has gained good experience, was a good professional in SLPP or APC, I approach them. Would you like to serve your country? Because I know you have these skills. We do it. It's not impossible. Like not at all. So you set the tone from the beginning. Second, you make everybody understand that results-based management is important to you. So there are some key ministries that I'll be visiting often. Start from the get-go. I go to the ministry, sit with the minister, meet their top directors, talk to them about the agenda and the results we expect, and ask them, how do I work with you and facilitate so you can deliver on those results? So we all have an understanding of the results I expect of those key ministries. And we'll repeat that periodically. Yeah? So first 100 days, set the tone on accountability, results-based management, and professionalism in the service. The other things you do, I declare immediately an education emergency. Under that, you'll see our manifesto, a number of things we're going to do. The educational system is very bad. Now, people have been robbed. But there are some things you do immediately. I announce immediately I have no interest in being chancellor of the University of Sierra Leone. I don't need that accolade. Let the academics do what they do best. Don't politicize it. The granting aid pro a a program, let us have, make sure it's transparent. It's also not politicized. Bamanja report. I don't want to reinvent the wheel, and I've said, you'll see in our manifesto, key principle, we scale up what is good. So we have to spend time to look at the good things our predecessors have done. We scale it up. The things that were not good, we see how we change them, and some that we can change fast, we change. Yeah? So in the first 100 days as well, there are things like that in education that we'll do. I also would like to get rid of the forms, the payment for forms, 500,000. You know how many kids have asked me to buy forms for them, application forms for university? And I said, but this is not necessary. All we need to do is make it online. They come there, they apply, it goes back. The university has less administrative responsibility. Yeah, no internet penetration in this country. Oh, That's we can organize it. We can organize it. You can do those very application centers in the university so they get free computers anyway. But I invest in it. Because I don't, for me, it's a barrier to access. And I believe education is the biggest liberator. Another thing I can do in the first 100 days, one thing I know for sure, the international community and the people of Sierra Leone invested heavily in developing various health sector plans as a result of Ebola. A lot of brain power and cash went into our recovery program. Yeah? Of course, we've not been able to implement all of them in two years. So I talk about a social sector accelerator program. Why accelerator? Don't reinvent the wheel. The good ideas that have been put in here, researched and developed, we accelerate implementation. And we can do a, take that report, we can do fast track in implementing a number of ideas. So I just gave you a few. Some in economics, mm -hmm. some in health and education. So what's going to be your signature involvement once you get elected? Um, Meaning what? What's signature if involvement? If you look at um, the current 
uh, president, Dr. Ernest Baikoma, his signature was infrastructure. Uh, what is going to be yours? What is the uh, Kande, Dr. Kandegi Mkela government going to be known for? Or what would you like there will, to be? There will not be one only. Because the problems we have are more serious. And this is the problem if you don't understand economics in full. You skew all your efforts in one direction. You don't realize that you're wrecking other aspects of this economy. So for me, there might be two or three, not one. It's not that simple. But I've given you two important ones to me health sector education, but diversification of the economy, getting the private sector uh, 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 enough financing and enabling condition so they grow the economy. Nothing happens without expanding that revenue base. We have to expand the revenue base. So part of that means you plug the stealing, the literal thieving of our people's money. Second, you got to support the private sector to grow this economy in agribusiness, in tourism. I want to copy what they're doing in Kenya with the uh, uh, digital economy. I see the Ghanaians are copying too, and I say, wait a minute, we have all these brilliant kids who want to be IT uh, uh, experts, who want to also write programs. If the Kenyans and the Ghanaians can do it, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll try to do it here. So I'm talking about economic diversification led by the private sector, but a true public uh, public-private partnership where we become facilitators, helping them, reducing the cost of doing business. You know, I say this often. I was in, in industrialization before. The hassles our people go through to clear their inputs, to get their inputs into factory, to produce something here, already raises their cost. That's one thing I would want to tackle my first 100 days. Can we make the clearance of goods quick for our business people? Because they do it in Guinea. They do it in Benin. Benin is a small country. Why not here? Why is it such a hassle? I'm sure tomorrow morning all the customs guys are angry with me. I'm not saying I fire people. I just want to incentivize, but also use digital systems. And that's what I know. Enhance the implementation of Asikuda and other technologies to make trade facilitation happen. So the goods arrive, the guy clears them quickly. They're in his uh, 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 warehouse, he's produced, he's now selling in the market. It's part of lowering the cost of doing business. I'll just give you a few examples of things you can do in short order by just reorganizing, working with people, working with the ministries to understand results, not just allocation. And yes, I, I pay attention to the Auditor General. You know the reforms of the civil service, people think it's impossible. No. Take the Auditor General's reports, the last five. You have agencies in this country that do not submit financial statements. Can you imagine in any country where that would happen? You run a business for the government and you don't have to report until you feel like. That's when they are political appointees, not under my system. What are you going to do about the inflated workforce we have currently? Yeah, that's, that's our biggest headache. 85 or 86,000. You know, we rationalize. That's the word the World Bank sometimes uses. Yeah, I, I was in the payroll ra rationalization process here back uh, when I was in government. What was in 94, 95? We had to do that. We had to do audits. I remember those days. One of the best education I had in government, and I used to talk about it in my policy class. In the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Agriculture, Works, those were the biggest culprits, ghost workers. Now they claim 85, 86,000 workers. We verify yeah, whether they exist or not. That's what I tell you about blocking those areas where there are leakages. I'll give you an article I wrote last year institutionalize leakages. So does this mean some government workers may actually possibly lose their jobs? I didn't say that. I said rationalize. You rationalize the, the, the payroll system. You remove the ghost workers. Remember, by the way, there were ghost workers even when our people were dying under Ebola. Nurses were not paid on time. Some were not paid for six months, but they were risking their life. Meanwhile, people were milking lots of money just by ghost. You know, bad habits are hard to live. When I saw that doing Ebola, it pained my heart that even when our people are dying in the thousands, people bloat payroll and refuse to pay the nurses. So you see why I started with that. Governance blocking those leakages. Because once you take that money that was supposed to go to health, education, uh, microfinance for the, for the poor market woman, you're stifling growth in the economy. So. Um, will rationalize that, that wage bill. And by the way, the IMF and World Bank has been warning about this. But let me tell you, month after month, 
it increases. So Alert we are in calendar. a political environment filled with slander Christmas and gossip. Eve. Let's get a few clarifications from you. Um, some of the labels being thrown around are that you are not uh, the most savvy when it comes to local politics. You do not understand local politics. And that you were sacked from the UN. Is this are you kidding me? They say I'm not the most savvy in local politics. But yet I have already changed the narrative by now. Two and a half years. So I, if I was savvy, then what would happen? I know I'm knowledgeable. Yeah, but what I learned working internationally and going to very good universities and teaching and doing research is that you don't have to know everything. You have to know how to find knowledge, to do research. That's why I came here two and a half years before elections, to learn on the ground. But also, I have some people who are good. I don't plan to do everything myself. And I have had very good people since I came back who know the ropes, who know how things are done that I was sacked from the UN. Let me tell you, the, you can go check this. I'll leave some documents for you. Ban Ki-moon appointed me already special representative of the Secretary, Secretary General for Sustainable Energy in September 2014 already. I still had my regular job for which I was elected. I had to negotiate with my board. I was supposed to finish December 2013. Uh, 2015, sorry, 2013, 2013. December 2013, I was supposed to finish. Uh, September 2012, Ban Ki-moon already announced that I want this man to be special rep for so-and-so. I had to step down to take that job because he said he's Mr. Energy. Can you spend another two years here helping me push a global agenda on energy and give us sustainable goal number seven? So how can I be fired when I already had a job offer, which is unique in the UN? Because he had to ask me, literally phone and ask, Kande, can you do this for the world? I said, yes, sir, because I'm passionate about energy. Nothing works without reliable, affordable energy. So how could I be sacked? Yeah? It's a sacrifice for my people. My, yeah, that's what I have done. A very good career, 10 years on the Secretary General, before I was even 55. I could have stayed there till maybe another 10 years. But I gave it up to come here and fix, help fix the problems. Bring progressives together in a vanguard movement to say our country will be great again. Salon force. So did you jump out of the SLPP because you wanted to lead at all costs? I, I left because values are different. And that's what I want the young generation to know. Avoid this syndrome in this country, na phobia. Post in the mass, you hate euphobia. It repeats by you, euphobia no more lowering the value system. Now, I left that party because the values are different from what my father and others had. We had the best of education here. We were not known for violence. Now, but I don't want to spend, I told people now, I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to think about negativity. I'm in my innovation mode, yeah? When I worked internationally, my friends used to say, Kande gets in a mode, which is his creative moment. That Zen period, if you see what I mean. And he just goes off. Initiatives, ideas, policy, strategy, targets. That's where I am now. My target is, how do I beat these guys? How do I get 1.8 million voters first round? That's where I am now. So I don't spend time on the negatives. Now I'm looking at numbers. Where, how? And then we, we, we cause a new youth revolution where we see young parliamentarians that are in their 30s, young councillors in their 30s, trying to define their destiny, not relying on somebody else's crooked, kleptocratic ways of trying to deprive them of a bright future. That's where I am now. So not in that old negative SLPP mode. I'm now thinking about the future, about winning. All right, you've heard about your vision. Uh, and some of the plans you have for this nation. So it is important here on AOIV on Sunday because we are the voice of the nation. We represent the voices out there that you speak directly to the nation, preferably in Creole. If you could look at this camera right here and um, let them know what you would like them to know. Well, Salon people, they are not saying that they watch this program. We don't do most of our English. I want to tell you, thank you. Una will give me the chance for I be the flag bearer for NGC, the National Grand Coalition. Yes, we they talk about change. What in that change they mean for you? It means that we sell na market money left na for feed your family. 
It means if you're not a youth man, you get good job. You get dignity in your host, then they respect you. It means if you're not a nurse where they work, then they pay you way months down because you they help other people. It means if you're not a teacher, we not get pin code 30 day with the same pin code for you because while you teach, we picking them better. We're going to make you become a professional. If you're not a serviceman in this country, military police, we go in, look at our conditions of service. We go make sure you get security of tenure so that you become depoliticized. The only way the university would they depoliticize on a university. Me and no one be chancellor of University of Salon or Jala. Let them professor then do their work so they go give una the best education way we be enjoy. And you know, sick man business bokunaya. Ebola don't deal with we. But we go change that and also now that change mean. Change means a good hospital. Now this country, woman, they go born picky, they die, they before you glad the way they go born, they're afraid if they come out there. Now this country still more youth man they die now than any nation. That's what so WHO say. When I go look at the report where they pulled two months ago, we want to change that. We for better. We they watch Arsenal and Manchester and Real Madrid, Chelsea. You they see how them picking and they then they live well. You see how them body they. Now that's our want for now. Let other people call it we safe. Let Ghana man can I call it like how they call it? Let one left for go banjul and guinea no more for buy market. Why they young cheap pass we on? Now because we get for clear certain thing there. So we say get free pots, let one do una business fine. Yeah? Now then thing and they will want to do for una, but all that's not the work if you don't get good leadership. Me can the young killer come for work for the common man. By the grace of the Almighty, inshallah, inshallah, we will, we will reach the together with una. But not only one get for do amo, now we all get for join on. And they look for them good young boy and young girl. We believe say then self or take charge of their destiny. Can't join NGC log you symbol. So you go be counselor. So you go be MP. But hey, we they go check now your community if they want you. We will go check now your community. But do ya? Una no afraid. Now time for come forward. Then youth man, then young girl. Now una get this election. Let no pop no shape money pounder. The money where then they bring, now the money where them if we don't give una forget job. Now that Ebola money so don't cancel. We don't want that. We want next time where politics can in five years after we don't get President Yom Keller, where politicians can't own and you get money now. Let God bless alone, let God bless Unaya. Yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kande Kole Yom Keller. Thank you.